firstly, just thank you very much to Claire at AJP and everyone at Nottingham and All Rights um, for organising this. I think, you know, we really appreciate having a day where we can all get together and stand and remember the animals together. Um, the importance of this event is paramount because it shows the strength of feeling that there is about animal experiments. Despite the fact that animal experiments are cruel and unreliable and that the data gathered from this dreadful practice cannot be reliably translated to people, some people still think that animal experiments have scientific value and that they can help to find cures for human diseases and conditions. For many scientists involved in animal research, the primate is seen as the gold standard and as superior to mice, rats or dogs. This can be for a number of reasons, because primates are obviously genetically very close to us, they have very advanced brains, they even have dexterous fingers and can be trained to play computer games and to touch things on a screen while their brains are being monitored. In 2016 in Great Britain, 2,440 primates were used for the first time in experiments. That's about 47 a week, roughly 7 a day, and if you count a working day as being 8 hours, one a primate an hour. So what exactly is happening every hour of every working day of every week to these beautiful, intelligent and sensitive animals? One use of primates which Animal Aid has recently highlighted is the use of monkeys to try to cure Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a terrible disease which affects humans. Some of you will know Andrew Taylor who died a year ago today. Andrew was the director of Animal Aid and sadly he suffered from Parkinson's. The symptoms of Parkinson's are many and varied, but the physical symptoms include shaking, which is known as tremors. These normally begin in the hand or the arm, and they're more likely to occur when the limb is relaxed and resting. There's a slowness of movement, which can make everyday tasks very difficult and can result in a distinctive slow shuffling walk with very small steps. Sufferers also have a tension in their muscles, which makes it difficult to move around and make facial expressions and this can result in painful muscle cramps. Now, these horrible symptoms, it's important to remember that in humans, these usually develop gradually. They're very mild at first, and they can develop in different orders, and their severity is different from people, but it's not something that comes off in the flash of an eye. But the way in which this disease is studied in monkeys is truly horrifying. We recently highlighted experiments conducted in London where 12 monkeys were injected with a brain damaging chem chemical which is called MPTP. This causes symptoms of paralysis, a lack of coordination, seizures and a hunched posture. The monkeys were force fed a drug after being given MPTP for up to 28 days. This is a drug which has been used for decades in human patients with Parkinson's. The drug causes uncontrollable body spasms, writhing and a twisted body posture. <coughs> These horrible effects are well known from previous similar experiments in monkeys. Over the course of the experiments, the monkeys were force-fed various drugs, observed for stretches of 10 hours at a time. And during this 10 hour period, they had blood samples taken from a vein in their thigh every 30 minutes. Their movement and their level of disability were recorded. They had access to water, but not for food, until the observation was finished. These 10-hour sessions were performed twice a week with a two-day washout period in between. And the study continued until all 12 monkeys had received all the different combinations of the drugs. After the experiment, the monkeys were destined to be used in further experiments. So how did these animals suffer? One important thing to recognise about scientific papers and scientific journals is they don't tell you how the animals suffer. They tend to leave clues and then we have to read between the lines of the cold and sterile descriptions. This particular paper states, several methods were used to minimise any suffering for the primates. These included specialised post-MPTP treatment. Aftercare was provided and included hand feeding of fluids liquidised high protein energy food, bathing and cleaning, and the use of padded insulated recovery units equipped with heated blankets, the extensive use of wooden ladders and cage furniture to assist the mobility of animals, because quite frankly they just couldn't get around as they would normally. 
Uh, MPTP causes severe immobilisation, so hand feeding would be absolutely essential, essential for these severely disabled animals because they just could not feed themselves. But the animals only need these adaptions because of what's been done to them because they've been poisoned. The terrible state these monkeys are left in by, giving, by being given the, tree, the chemical MPTP is chilling. For any animal to be so disabled by a chemical that it's unable to eat or drink by themselves and needs to be bathed is truly horrific. These animals are intelligent and are usually capable of running, jumping and grooming themselves and others. The inability to do these things shows how terrible MPTP is for both the physical and mental well-being of these animals. The padding units suggest that the animals would be falling about, so would require padding so as not to be injured. And the insulation and heated blankets also suggest how poorly the poor animals are likely to feel. The researchers also said that they would use half-sized cages for the really severely disabled animals. As if all this horrendous suffering alone were not enough to stop Parkinson's research with primates, there are fundamental scientific problems with the use of marmosets and other, and other primates in Parkinson's disease research. Using primates has confused human disease research because the data conflicts. It's not surprising, they're different creatures. It's failed to deliver treatments for Parkinson's and other major diseases. Monkeys don't get Parkinson's and the symptoms induced in them by brain poisoning fail to replicate key features of the disease in humans. For example, brain poisoned monkey, monkeys will gradually recover, whereas Parkinson's is a degenerative disease in humans. Marmosets don't suffer from breast tremor, which is an important symptom suffered by people with Parkinson's. Monkeys don't develop Lewy bodies, these are clumps of abnormal protein and they're a key hallmark of Parkinson's disease and are found in the brains of human patients. The progress of Parkinson's is slow and chronic, whereas the symptoms experienced by the monkeys are acute and severe. Animal aid is not alone in its condemnation of primates being used to model human specific diseases. Dr. Marius Maxwell, who's an Oxford, Cambridge and Harvard trained neurosurgeon, strongly criticised the use of primates on scientific grounds. He said, It's widely acknowledged that profound disparity, anatomical, physiological, neurochemical, pathological and temporal, exists between the MPTP non-human primate model and humans with Parkinson's. Despite these paramount concerns of reproducibility, hundreds of studies involving thousands of animals have followed, with conflicting and non-predictive results. The Executive Director of the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, which is a large charity in the US, said, Mice don't get Parkinson's, nor for that matter do monkeys, yet these are the organisms on which tests are done before new drugs are tested in people. What this means is that just because something works in a mouse or a monkey, it doesn't mean that it will work in a human. Marius Maxwell also said, It's clear to anyone who cares to study the matter closely, honestly, objectively, that the scientific justification for non-human primate vivisection is unsound. I cannot accept that its practitioners really believe it to be morally or ethically defensible either. The argument that supports non-human primate experimentation because of close kinship to humans, but blind to their moral worth, denies them ethical rights, is sinister and repugnant. Now, we know quite a lot about the MPTP experiment because it was published in a journal, and you can get hold of journals on the internet, and you can read them, and you can find out exactly what happens. Some experiments, such as those conducted for regulatory toxicology, are less publicised. These, these typically involved animals being dosed, whether that's force feeding, injections, or inhalation, in order to discover how poisonous a substance is, or whether a drug works. These experiments are typically carried out in contract research organizations, and they don't publish their experimental results. They're basically places, places where they're paid to conduct experiments on animals, to test drugs, weed killers, and paints, and the data is passed on to the clients who pay for the animal testing. 
Last year, as I said, 2,440 primates were used for the first time. They were used in 3,569 procedures. And of that number of procedures, 2,800 were for regulatory use. So that's about 80% of the experiments, or four out of five procedures. Because they're close to us genetically, researchers believe that monkeys, primates, make more reliable models in which to study human disease or product toxicity. But although they're very similar, they're not the same. There are profound differences at every level. And the fact that their brains are many times smaller than ours, they function different, differently and they're composed differently, it makes experimenting on them futile at best and dangerous at worst. Time and time again, primate researchers fail to predict dangerous side effects of medication. It's also led researchers down blind alleys and delayed real, real cures for reaching people. For example, there was a drug which was nicknamed the Elephant Man drug, TGN 1412. In 2006, it was going through first in man trials and it caused six healthy volunteers to suffer multiple organ failure. The drug was designed to dampen the immune system of patients suffering chronic leukemia and rheumatoid arthritis. Instead, it supercharged the immune response of six human volunteers, unleashing devastating multiple organ failure. The drug had previously been tested in many species, including primates. The primates had had weeks of repeated dose toxicity. They'd been given the medication in doses 500 times higher than the human volunteers, and yet they had no conspicuous side effects. After this catastrophe, the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control demonstrated that the drug's catastrophic effects can be predicted through an in vitro, which means in glass, test, in which human cells were combined. We also know of an arthritis drug that was tested on monkeys. They tolerated the medication well, but in humans it caused deaths. The arthritis drug called Ofrin was known to have killed 61 people. There have been over 3,500 cases of severe reactions. Opera was tested on monkeys without any problems. One other way, way we can get information, which was mentioned by Angie Greenaway earlier, is through non-technical summaries. These are basically part of the license application. So when you're a vivisector who wants to torture some animals, you go to the Home Office and you fill out a license telling them what you intend to do. So the summaries, and only the summaries, are available on the Home Office website. But, and this is a big but, they're normally published months, if not years, after the actual license has been granted. So the experiment is likely to have already begun or may have already finished. This makes it impossible to challenge what has been done to the animals. They've already been harmed, killed, dissected and incinerated. One summary we found describes experiments which aim to understand how certain areas of the brain support processes such as learning and making decisions. The experiments would involve eight monkeys. The researchers describe them as going, undergoing a number of separate and well-spaced surgeries. Now we know from previous similar work that this typically involves the removal of a section of skin and the underlying skull. The monkey then has a head cap attached, which is secured in place using dental cement. This allows the experimenters easy access to the monkey's brains for recording its activity. The monkeys usually, at a later date, will have a head holder attached to their skull, which enables them to be held rigidly in place for hours, while electrodes are inserted into their brains. During the testing and recording periods, these wonderful, intelligent and extremely agile animals will typically be seated in restraint chairs in which their legs will be strapped to the legs of the chair and their hands shielded from their faces, possibly with their arms strapped to the chair arms. In this way they can operate the joystick, touch a screen to point out images, they can't scratch their faces, they can't touch the expensive electrodes or otherwise interfere with the recording equipment. The chair in this case is described as an enclosed testing chair. Please just take a moment to consider and imagine the total feeling of abject helplessness. You're strapped into a chair, unable to move, and you don't know why you're there. 
Once the monkey is undergoing the testing part of these procedures, electrodes will be inserted into the monkey's brains in order to collect data. Now you might wonder how experimenters make the monkeys cooperate with their grizzly work. Do they give them rewards of their favourite food? No. It's commonly thought amongst researchers that this sort of reward doesn't remain attractive to the animals for long enough. They could put on weight, they could stop eating their normal food in preference for these treats. So in order to make them cooperate, the monkeys may have their food and water rationed, which is described in this particular summary as controlled food or fluid regimen. Typically, this means the monkeys are working for a few drops of fluid as a reward. The researchers explain that this is to reward and maintain task motivation and dietary fitness. So, trapped in a chair, unable to move, held in place by your head, thirsty and working so you can drink. The summary of this research explains that these experiments typically last two to three years. Over this time, the monkeys will be subject to having electrodes penetrate their brain and restrained and thirst for between 15 and 45 days. The side effects noted in the summary of cutting open the animal skulls and inserting electrodes into their brains can include infection within their skulls, brain hemorrhage and seizures. Once the animals have endured these operations, restraint and deprivation, they will be killed with an anaesthetic overdose. The experimenters explain that they must use primates as their primate brains have an anatomical and functional overlap with a section of brain that they wish to study in humans. The experimenters say that they will try to minimize the harm to the animals, and one way of doing this is by giving animals a small dose of oral sedative for the first few days after new procedures are first introduced. Is the brain area being studied in these monkeys identical to that in man? Despite morally reprehensible and ethically unjustifiable tortures, can it be argued that this research is scientifically robust? Of course it can't. The aim of the torture was to understand how certain areas of brain, human brain, support processes such as learning and making decisions. But the composition of different areas in the primate brain and that of the human are hugely different. We all know that animal experiments are scientifically flawed, ethically repugnant. Yet we need to convince other members of our society that all animal experiments not only fail the animals involved, but also the humans waiting for a cure or a treatment for their condition. I've talked about two specific experiments involving 20 monkeys. But as I mentioned earlier, 2,440 monkeys were used in last year. That is the tip of the iceberg. In 2016, almost 4 million animals were used in laboratories in Great Britain. The great majority of these animals were mice, about 74, 75%. And mice, despite their tiny size, are just as important as primates. Each of these animals was an individual, and each of these animals count. To all those individual animals, I say, we remember you, we mourn your loss, and we are sorry for what our fellow humans did to you. Thank you.